Well, I didn't plan to come to Google to get razzed about my hair, but I guess uh, I just don't know what to expect. So thanks for keeping me on my toes, uh, Justin. Thank you all for, uh, for joining me today. It's a great privilege to get to be here. I would like to share a little bit about some of the problems of violence in the developing world, but I'd like to start with a story from, from Oregon, the state of Oregon. And maybe some of you who are joining us from Northern California uh, might, might relate. Um, so there's this young woman just a few months ago who's home alone in her house. She lives in a rural area. And just a few months before, actually, she had been horrifically assaulted by this guy. Uh, and this guy is now at her house, actually. It's a, a weekend night. She's a, alone. It's dark. And this guy's actually tearing his way into her house. And she does what anyone else would do. She picks up the, the phone to call 911, right? And then what proceeds to happen is the 911 operator engages this very, very tense conversation where she explains to this young woman that, I'm sorry, but because of budget cuts in your area, you don't have law enforcement in your area. Uh, that well, there's no one that we can send for you. Uh, law enforcement was available on the weekdays, but this was the weekend. And there's this incredibly painful 10 minutes of conversation where this 911 operator realized there's just nothing that she can do for this woman. And uh, horrifically, of course, the man did make his way into the house, horrifically assaults her and rapes her. And this story did sort of make the news around the world. And the, the reason I, I share it, though, is because this is an example of what billions of poor people in the world live in as their daily reality. Why is that? Because they don't have law enforcement in their area. A recent UN study found that about four billion people in the world live outside the protection of law. And one of the things we're trying to do in this book, The Locust Effect, is first of all, get the news of this out and then have us pause together to think about that for a moment. What if billions, especially of the poorest people in the world, don't have access to basic law enforcement? What does that look like? Well, we know a bit what it feels like because of the story of this woman, but it looks like something different in Bolivia, for instance, where according to statistics, if you sexually assault a child in Bolivia, you actually are at greater risk of slipping in the shower and dying than you are of actually being convicted for that crime. And as a result, there's just an epidemic of sexual violence against women and girls in Bolivia. In India, amazingly, if you enslave someone, you have a greater chance of being struck by lightning than ever being actually convicted for that crime. So this is what it looks like in the developing world when you have this complete collapse of law enforcement and then what the locust effect tries to do is then tell the story of the violence that this collapse has unleashed for the poorest in the world. And we go to four categories of violence against the poor. The first one is what we call gender violence. It's just sexual violence and domestic abuse against women and girls, which according to the World Health Organization, it accounts for more death and disability in the world than malaria, cancer, car accidents, and war all combined. The greatest threat for the average poor person in the developing world, especially a woman or a girl, is violence close at home, sexual violence or domestic abuse. I got to know a good deal about this working with International Justice Mission, uh, which by the way, so grateful for Google's partnership in this work trying to protect the poorest from violence. Um, and what we do is we have uh, teams in the developing world who are local indigenous nationals and they are lawyers and criminal investigators and social workers, and they take on these cases of violent abuse and oppression on behalf of the victims and seek justice for them, make sure the perpetrators are brought to justice, and make sure that we provide long-term care for the survivors of this abuse. And so now we've been doing this for almost 20 years. We've had tens of thousands of cases of this violent abuse. And it's getting to know those cases that allows us to see the reality. And it came home for me meeting this woman, Lucilla, in Peru. Uh, Lucilla is a, a common uh, Andean mom who's trying to provide for her little family. And as I got to know her, I came to know the story of living in her little town. She experienced the horrific rape and murder of her eight-year-old girl who was just dumped out on the street. They didn't even have the, I don't know, uh, they didn't even bother with the shame of like throwing her in the river or anything. They just left her out on the street. 
and to follow Lucilla on the journey to see what it means to try to get justice for such a crime when you have no functioning law enforcement. One of the things I found out about Lucilla's little town in the Andean Mountains is that it actually had a higher rate of sexual assault against women and girls than what was coming out of the worst war zones of the Congo. And this was also the idea that there can be levels of violence taking place that maybe in the headlines we hear about it um, when it's in a, a war or a conflict or a genocide, but we're talking in this book about everyday violence. The second category of everyday violence that afflicts the poor is straight up slavery. The Global Slavery Index just came out in October and it uh, affirmed that there's about 30 million people in the world who are literally held in slavery. That's more people in slavery than at any other time in human history. About 11 million people were extracted from Africa during 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade. But today, there's about 30 million held in slavery. Uh, in the book, you get the sort of up-close view of this uh, from getting to know Mariama and the story of her family and a number of other villagers who were held as slaves in a brick factory. And this is not in some completely remote, lawless part of India either. This is really just uh, on the beltway outside Bangalore, which is, as you know, the high-tech capital in many ways of, of India. But it would just take us a matter of minutes before we could be able to drive with investigators to be able to find places of literal slavery. So that's the second category of, of violence is, is slavery. Third is the reality of police abuse in the lives of the poor. The World Bank did this global study which revealed that it said police and courts in the developing world actually make poor people less secure and poorer. Uh, what you find is that poor people in the developing world don't run to the police for protection and to be safe. They run from the police to be protected and safe. Statistics will also show that the police are likely to actually steal more from a common poor person than anybody else in their community, just from the daily grind of extortion and bribery. So that's the fourth category of violence. I mean, the third. The fourth is violent land seizure, the way that millions of poor people every year are threatened with having their land stolen from them. In fact, about five million a year find themselves forcibly thrown off their land. One of the largest categories of victims of land theft are widows. Widows like Susan, who was one of our clients in Uganda. And one of the things we don't realize is that widows in the developing world support about a half a billion orphans. And so if you throw that family off their little plot of land where they have their little shelter and their little garden and they're trying to sort of make their way out of poverty, you have just decimated their capacity to go forward. All of this, I emphasize, is what we're calling everyday violence. Because many times when we see or hear about violence, it's the stuff that makes the headlines. Uh, the big wars, uh, the genocide. I know something about the, uh, about the phenomenon of genocide. I was the, the director of the UN's genocide in Rwanda in 1994. And my job was to sort through about 100 different mass graves and massacre sites to see what it looks like when human beings just unleash violence against one another. And the thing that you notice when you're digging through all of that and you're trying to picture what's it like in the moment of genocide to be in that place, you realize that that person in the moment of terror is really not crying out for someone to bring them food or a doctor or a teacher or a microloan, right? They're crying out for someone to restrain the hand of the machete that's coming towards them and their family. And this is what we are identifying in terms of our engagement with the poor. We know a great deal about providing food and medicine and education and other basic needs, but what about the violence? And so this is an effort through the locust effect to begin to open our eyes to this epidemic. We're calling it the locust effect. It comes from these stories from history that are very powerful when you've got these poor farmers who are sort of starting to scrape their way out of poverty and all, all of their work and ambition is in their crops, right? And, they're, and they see them growing and, and they offer great promise. And then one day the locusts just descend. And honestly, in a matter of hours, they will just wipe out years of work. And this is the way violence operates in the developing world for the poor who are trying to get out of poverty. The violent predators just come through and take it away. And so this means there are tremendous implications for all of us who care about global poverty. Probably all of us in our lifetime in some way have been engaged with that struggle, right? We've 
given some money, we've sought you know, fresh water, we've sponsored a child, we've helped with a school somewhere, we've sponsored a, a microloan. And so all of these are, are extremely important efforts and, and, and we've seen a lot of significant pr uh, progress over the last 30 years in addressing poverty. But what we're starting to see now is we may be reaching the limit of what can be done if we don't begin to address the locus of violence who can come in and just sweep the benefits of all that effort away. The thing you'll notice about the locusts as well is that not only do the locusts descend and destroy the fruit of the farm work, but the farm work is not going to stop the locust. Right? We have to actually start to do something differently. And so that's what the locust effect is trying to do, is to begin to change the conversation about poverty to make sure that we're mainstreaming the problem of violence. Because if that's off the radar screen, uh, we're going to miss out on something that's undermining all of our good work. One of the things that the book tries to do is to try to say, well, why is law enforcement so broken in the developing world? Why is there such a lawless chaos for the average poor person. The book brings forth really three surprises and then one thing that's not so surprising. The first surprise is to realize, oh, all these law enforcement systems in the developing world, they were never designed to stop crime. They were never designed to protect the common poor person from violence. They were set up by colonial powers over the, the first stage of the 20th century in order to protect the government from the common people. And they've never been re-engineered to actually enforce the law. And as a result, poor people in the developing world now have great laws. This tremendous human rights revolution over the last 50 years has embedded great laws in these countries. But what they don't have is law enforcement. And it turns out that that really matters. And mostly because they've been saddled with these colonial systems of law enforcement that have never been re-engineered. The second reason you find out is that there has been a massive privatization of security in the developing world. So if you've been traveling in the developing world at all, you'll sort of maybe notice, especially in your first visit there, like almost everywhere I go, somebody's got a gun guarding us. I mean, he's at the, at the restaurant, he's at the hotel, they're at the uh, whatever sort of commercial enterprise. There are just people providing physical protection all the time. I was at the World Economic Forum at Davos uh, a few years ago with a number of corporate leaders who have massive investments in the developing world. Um, huge facilities, thousands and thousands of employees. And I just ask, with all this violence in the developing world that we're aware of, like how do you guys protect your people and your property? And they all kind of look at each other and they actually almost answer in unison to say, we pay for it. But if you think about this, it's one thing if those with wealth and influence leave the public school and the public school kind of it's bad, or you leave the transportation, public transportation system and the buses become not so great. But what happens when the people of wealth and power abandon the public justice system? When the basic law enforcement system is allowed to get worse and worse and worse? That is the reality in the developing world. And part of the reason it stayed off the radar screen of everybody is that the sector of wealthy uh, folks in the developing world from whom the economic uh, growth is coming from have been able to secure themselves with private security. And so now in the aggregate, if you look at that country, it produces a decent rate of economic growth. But for people who are living off, let's say, $2 a day, that's about 2 billion, more than 2 billion people. Those folks can't afford to be safe, and so they're not. The fourth uh, sort of not, or rather the third other surprising reason behind sort of the brokenness of law enforcement is it's just not been the subject of our investment. We've poured trillions of dollars over the last 50 years into food systems, water systems, public health systems, all totally vital. And actually, we haven't necessarily spent enough on trying to engage those systems because the poor need all of those things. But we can't find even 1% of all that uh, expenditure and effort over the last 50 years that has gone to building public justice systems that will actually protect the poor from violence. So the third surprise is to say, oh, we haven't actually really tried all that hard to address this problem yet. The fourth explanation is, is less surprising, perhaps, and that's just the idea that there are people in power in the developing world who have figured out how to succeed in the absence of public justice, right? And so they now actually would feel quite threatened if justice system actual, systems actually started working in the way that they should. So that's the diagnosis that we're trying to make here in the locust effect. But then we try to make a turn towards hope, and that is to ask, okay, great, this is totally depressing, massive violence, <laughs> grotesque, 
Uh, there's no way I'm going to read this book. I'm <laughs> depressed already. My wife is like, yeah, give me a gin and tonic. The next time you're going to try to read one of your books, Gary. And um, so, yeah, the bad news is true. But this is part of where the good news comes from, right? Because if you think about the era when the AIDS epidemic was really beginning to catch momentum in the world, it required everybody to open their eyes to something that was still a little beneath the surface, but if unaddressed, was going to roll over just about everything else. And that's where we are when it comes to the phenomenon of violence in the developing world. So yes, we got to wake up to what is the tough reality. But the hope can be found on a number of areas. The first is just in history. The truth is all of us enjoy reasonably functioning justice systems here in New York, or you can be in the San Francisco Bay Area or Chicago, or you're around the world in Paris or Tokyo or various places around the world that have the more uh, developed and affluent economies. And in each one of those cities, you will find a history where 100 years ago, 150 years ago, you would have had the exact same levels of just horrific violence and horrific police corruption and brutality. In the book, we give actually a series of descriptions uh, to ask you to like, guess which city this is. And you think you're reading from some just nightmare of a city in the developing world. But actually, it's one of the cities that we live in. And you can see, oh, every country begins with a difficult situation of lawless violence, and you need to be, build systems to protect uh, the common citizenry. And so how, what is the process by which you move to uh, law enforcement that actually protects the common person. And you learn that this is actually quite a doable thing. So you learn these lessons from history and some clues about what might happen in the developing world, but also some very specific projects that we have uh, uh, highlighted in the book where the success is really very encouraging. That if you focus on helping law enforcement do its job, it has a dramatic result. One of those uh, projects we did in the second largest city of uh, the Philippines called Cebu, which had a horrible problem of child sex trafficking. Uh, the abduction and taking of these young minor girls into the commercial sex industry, and it's just the business of rape for profit. And this was just taking place at a horrific level in the city of Cebu. And we got some funding from the Gates Foundation to try and experiment. Let's see whether or not it's possible to do two things. Number one, let's see if we can actually stand up local law enforcement, which when we first uh, began the project in the city, uh, was actually on, almost on the side of sex trafficking, right? They're actually protecting this and receiving funding for doing so. Um, and by the way, the, the people who carried out this project were our local Filipino staff, right? local Filipino lawyers, Filipino criminal investigators, and social workers. And they were trying to do two things. One, can we stand up that local law enforcement through training and uh, programs of empowerment that allow them to actually begin to send sex traffickers uh, to jail? And if we do that, will it actually then lower the amount of sex trafficking of kids in the city? So we had some outside auditors come in at the beginning and measure, well, how much victimization of kids is there in the sex trade uh, before the project even begins? And then let's measure it four years later to see what the impact is. So four years training law enforcement, setting up specialized units, uh, fast-tracking courts, providing good social services to the victims so they could actually make their way through the justice system and receive healing. So after rescuing hundreds of those victims and then sending about 100 of the traffickers to jail, what was the outcome uh, after uh, four years? The goal of the project was to try to achieve a 20% reduction in the victimization of kids in the commercial sex trade. But after four years, the auditors came back and measured, and they found a 79% reduction in the victimization of kids in the commercial sex trade. And what you find is that those who brutalize the poor and children especially are not brave people. They're doing it because they can. And once they start getting in trouble for it, they start to leave the children and the kids alone. So this is sort of the reality that we're helping people to recover through the book that yes, there's a real serious problem in the world, but there's really uh, hopeful uh, possibilities for, for making a difference. I would of course uh, say that the real purpose of this book is to begin to change the conversation about poverty. Right? Because if you enter a discussion about global poverty, if you think of the phenomenon of yourself, you think of, okay, food and hunger, you think of medical care, you think of shacks, you think of bad sanitation, bad education, the need for microloans, all that sort of thing. 
But what does not generally come to our mind is the violence that the poor are chronically vulnerable to. And we just want to change that conversation to make sure we're asking the question, what about the violence? So we would like you to be a, a part of that uh, for sure. We'd love for you to buy the book, first of all. Um, educate yourself, share it with other people. If you buy the book uh, this week, we actually have some donors that are going to uh, match that with a $20 contribution towards the actual work in the field of trying to defend uh, those who are victims of abuse. And you can probably get a, uh, we'll have a copy here. And uh, Victor Boutros, who's my co-author, I just want to recognize him, Victor uh, Boutros. We'll be happy to, to sign those, and that will you know, add four cents to the value of the book or something. <laughs> um, uh, so we would love for you to buy the book and, uh, and, to, and to share that. Um, the second thing we'd like to do is, is actually have you have a look at a piece of video that we've put together to, to likewise uh, share on social media. Um, because obviously we've written this book, it's got 40 pages of footnotes, it really takes you into sort of the deep intellectual case about what's going on. But for most of us in many ways it's important just for us to get a, um, just a heart level almost sense of what this challenge is looking like for the common person and also for what the promise is. So uh, if you've got two minutes, let's have a look at this uh, video and then um, we'll talk about one more thing we can do together. That's the second thing we'd love you to do, just help get the conversation going by sharing that, that piece of video. Uh, the third thing is that right now uh, at the United Nations, there's a tremendously important conversation taking place related to the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, in the year 2000, uh, the international community came together to build sort of the definitive roadmap for addressing poverty, and they set out these eight Millennium Development Goals, and have been pursuing them over the last 15 years and have seen some really significant pro 
progress on those targeted things. The big problem that people are starting to realize, though, is that they spoke of the massive solution to try to uh, deal with poverty, and they did not say a word about violence. And now we imagine you're trying to move the world forward out of poverty, but you're not doing anything about this violence that is just ripping the rug out from underneath everyone's uh, ability to move forward. So we have a petition that we're putting together, and there's a way to uh, sign on there that will just be going to uh, the UN team that is starting to put together the Millennium Development Goals to say, hey, let's just make sure that this conversation includes addressing the violence that is descending like locusts upon the poor in the developing world. This is, again, from the AIDS epidemic uh, perspective, it wasn't just the public health experts, it wasn't just the uh, sort of uh, global affairs experts that rang the alarm about the problem and said, no, this is something we need to address. It was very, very common people who began to think differently about the problems in the world and to make sure that we were addressing this epidemic as well. And I think it's an opportunity for all of us to raise our voice on behalf of those who are victims of violence as well. So thank you very much for the opportunity to let me drone on here a bit, but I would love to, uh, I've been trying to guess about what if any of this might be interesting to you, but it actually might be better to actually ask you. So what questions do you have? Uh, how might we engage the conversation together? And I understand from Justin, un unlike his prior advertisements to me, I don't even actually get to be able to hear from the folks uh, remotely. So you guys carry all the burden of asking, the engaging a good question. So here you go. What are thoughts, questions? Yes. Um, the question is two for one is uh, when we provide today the help like meals, food and everything you, you mentioned, uh, do we have stats uh, on does that decrease violence in those countries that we had the way we had yeah. and by which factor? Yeah. Uh, and two, uh, this experiment that you did uh, in this city with the sex trafficking, uh, how much did it cost? Uh, and can you put a price or a light set or whatever like uh, on this program compared to if you had given meals and food and whatever, what would be the benefit? Yeah, great question. Um, sort of uh, going at the, the, the first one, I mean the, the second one first, uh, the data on the actual cost of law enforcement is, is available to us. They give you an idea of, of what it would cost. The data is not very good about what the um, how much the economic benefit is from all of that. Uh, and so it's just being very much developed. But what you can see, for instance, is that where the studies have been done, that GDP is reduced somewhere between 2 and 7 percent in the entire nation by criminal violence and, and violence in the community. You will see, in, they did some studies in Latin America where they showed half of the accumulated net social capital was reduced, uh, was eliminated half of it over a 15 year period of time because of violence. They're starting to begin to develop the numerical costs of violence. It costs, for instance, in what they call disability adjusted life years, about nine million disability adjusted life years uh, are wasted because of violence against women and girls. And so that's massive amounts of productivity. Uh, what you also know is that the uh, economies that are actually producing social mobility are the ones that provide protection for those who um, are poorest. Because in the absence of that, they're unable to keep even the benefits of their effort. Some of this is hard to see, though, because in, as I explained a little bit, in poor, low-income and middle-income countries right now, you actually see some significant uh, rates of economic growth. Uh, reasonable GDP advancements. But what you see when you look at it and, and disaggregate it is that that economic growth is coming from the sector of the country that has uh, protected itself with private security. And that's a massive expense, by the way, uh, that could be poured into public security, but at the moment is just privatizing part of it. There's still, one of the things that the book does is call for much greater study of how much would this cost, what would the benefit be, but there certainly is now enough data from the World Bank and from uh, other multilateral institutions that suggest that what is lost to violence is massive and that if we don't get out in front of it, that kind of cost is just going to grow. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you. So the first question was, People are looking at this from an economic modeling standpoint. Are people looking at it also from a public health standpoint? Yes. Um, 
because the models might be different. And the other question was, I'm curious about the, I mean, solving this at the macro level seems very hard, right? Because right. you have civil societies that have may not have traditions, of, and they differ radically. Right. So, yeah, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. And maybe, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, certainly uh, this has, over just maybe the last 15 years, been looked at now as an epidemiological matter from the public health sector. In fact, the World Health Organization, it was about 10, 15 years ago now, did this massive global study about violence as a health problem. And that's where much of the data from the, uh, for, for the book is now coming from, is the World Health Organization and public health experts are dialed into sort of the implications, the ripple effects of violence in the lives of poor people. What public health has no experience in, however, is how you stop the violence. Um, and what has been unfortunate is that world of law enforcement that actually uh, reduces violent behavior uh, is sort of been often its own silo and public health has been often its silo. And what we're encouraging now is that those things come together. There's been uh, some uh, work done on um, uh, the economics of violence and the way that undermines economic uh, uh, growth, and but most of that's been done in developed countries. Uh, so uh, obviously the data is easier and more available, uh, and it's a little too bad the way uh, our study tends to run to the places where the examination of the problem is easiest. Um, that makes sense in a certain kind of way, but we do need to bring a lot of those lenses now into the developing world to fully appreciate what, what's happening. The other uh, uh, question is, is absolutely the one to be answered, which is, wow, this just sounds like this massive generic problem that actually is very localized in its um, manifestations and probably in its solutions. How do we begin to address it? Um, one of our suggestions in the book is precisely that what is needed are some small-scale experiments in some focused places in the world. Uh, it's true, for instance, that penicillin works everywhere in the world, and there are certain ways in which law enforcement works everywhere. That is to say, uh, in almost every context, if human beings uh, face a, a, a cost for doing a behavior, they are reduced in their likelihood of doing it. That, it that's just true the way, same way that uh, penicillin just works. Uh, but what it takes in a, in a given society and culture for law enforcement to be effective and to uh, be supported by the, the community, that's a different equation everywhere. So we're interested in supporting and actually are pursuing now. Uh, we have uh, seven different projects around the world, like the Cebu one, which says, okay, not everywhere in regard to everything, but let's start in a few laboratories and begin to experiment. What does it take in order to do one, one thing first, stand up local law enforcement? Have the police and the courts and the public justice system actually switch sides? So that instead of preying upon the poor, they're actually protecting the poor. And we've actually learned quite a bit about that. And there's some things you see that are common in most communities, and there's other things that are very particular. And so what there needs to be is just a much more robust experimentation of this in the world. Uh, because again, it's not going to come from a silver bullet, one size fits all. We did it here in America, so it's gonna work over here. It's going to be a customized, tailor-made, and community-owned struggle. Uh, in order to bring justice uh, for the, the poor. But that's what we need to start to uh, uh, bring resources and effort to that's commensurate to the size of the problem. Thank you. Other questions? Please, Justin. So being that we are at Google, I'm yes, curious we are. what your thoughts are on the role that technology can play in being a constructive element of these changes. Yeah. Well, one of the things I'm hoping technology will do is just sort of shrink the, aware, the, the, the world in terms of awareness, right? Because one of the things that's difficult in this era is we can live on different planetary systems, right? I mean, the, the, the idea that there are millions of people in slavery, the idea that sexual assault can take place at such a level that uh, you're more likely to fall in the shower than to ever uh, go to jail for it, those can feel so far from us. And one of the things that uh, this era has done is shrink that world so that everyone can be much more aware of this. One of the things that we're also starting to, to bring is, is visualization of this. I mean, 
Our teams now do undercover investigations that expose these kinds of abuses that are taking place, and that stuff can now almost be shared real time around the world. It's gonna be harder and harder to get away from this, I mean, to get away with this stuff. But once we have exposure, then we gotta meet, need to move actually towards solutions. The other thing that technology <clears throat> has a capacity to do amazingly is bring accountability and transparency. You're starting to see this in the corruption realm now, where um, instead of uh, paying a, 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 a police officer for your ticket on the spot, you go to some kiosk somewhere electronically and pay for that. So there isn't even the opportunity for the police officer to take the money. Or to like be able to go register and say, uh, uh, yeah, there were supposed to be police in our community and yet this is day 20 where we've never seen anybody. And all that sort of data and that picture starts to um, uh, appear. So uh, we're e even exploring the ways in which um, satellite imagery is able to actually see where the brick kilns and are in South Asia, where there's more likely to be slavery. So there's, uh, and, and the, the tracking of, of criminality, the new VP of investigations um, at IJM is the former director of NCIS. And he's very interested in trying to leverage technology in, in this crime fighting effort around the world. So. Uh, I'm not the one certainly is able to suggest what all the possibilities are, but what I would love to do is to see those who have this expertise and these capacities to sort of join the struggle and the fight. Yes, sir. Just, with, just as an idea, with the proliferation of cell phones, more yes. phones throughout the world, what about the self-reporting? Absolutely. Yeah, you do notice that right now. Almost there are very few bad things that happen these days sort of in any kind of public way, uh, especially law enforcement and so forth, that there aren't five people around with a cell phone. Uh, challenge, of course, in the poorest communities is the people living off $2 a day have less access to that. And, and, and to be clear, you can see why this is why crime runs to those places, right? It runs to be amongst the poor because they're going to be the least empowered. Um, one of the things we do, of course, is take uh, that kind of technology into those communities and into some of the darkest places where crime is taking place, infiltrate it with uh, uh, video technology, and now the world can see and know what's going on. And that is, you, you have to know that when you think about violent perpetrators of horrific crime, they just seem so uh, intimidating and how could you ever go against them? But one of the things you have to understand about criminality and violence is that there's a reason why they hide it. Because they're afraid. Right? You fundamentally hide what you're doing because you're afraid that if somebody saw it, you would be in trouble and you couldn't get away with it. And as our world has the technology increasingly for where the, the bullies cannot do this without being seen, they're going to do it less. So there's significant promise. The question now, I think, substantially, is how to get those tools increasingly in the hands of those who are poorest. Yeah. Daniel, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, you were you're talking about experiments. I know that you know, there have been a number of things on experiments in, the, in trying to improve poverty, like the, that team of MIT. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any work with them? Can you describe some of your other projects? Yeah, no, we haven't had the opportunity of the Poverty Lab at MIT that actually did an, a really fantastic project with Indian police uh, to actually see uh, what it would take for the community to actually begin to have greater confidence uh, in working with the police. And it's, it's like all great research. There's a set of things that are confirmed by the data that, oh yeah, we really did think that that would help. Uh, and then it also turns out, nope, everybody thought this would help, doesn't help at all. Uh, so. Uh, we would love to have an opportunity to engage some of our work with that kind of very careful um, sort of measurement capacity because that's what it's going to take. It's going to be sort of taking what we think we know about improving these law enforcement systems and then testing it and, and measuring and seeing what actually does work and let's put more resources on the things that actually work. Yeah. So you talked about uh, violence as a contributing cause to poverty. Yeah. What about the causes of the violence itself? Yeah. How much of that is perhaps need-driven? Yes. I mean, is it cultural? Is it innate? Does mankind just suck? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a very small percentage of people having a very large impact on the community? Or yeah. Or do we discuss you know, violence as an effect? I, I'd love to. Um, 
I will tell you, any of you mm. taken a genocide course in college or something and look at genocide, I mean, it's disturbing. The capacity for the very common person to become very, very violent in regard to their neighbors is amazing. And as the um, investigator of the Rwandan genocide, the story is there that once the restraints, the restraints were taken off and you could do anything to your neighbor to take their land, to uh, sexually assault uh, uh, the neighbor's daughter, and to kill your neighbor. Um, this is unleashed with quite frightening uh, ferocity. Uh, so there is something in human beings that just needs to be accounted for. And, and we have seen in history, too, that the way that most violence is restrained is by law enforcement. That's why we all have law enforcement. None of you are choosing to live in a neighborhood that has no law enforcement. Uh, but it would be interesting, and if I had a, a whiteboard here, you could draw a graph of, of crime. And on the left axis, you would put different kinds of crime uh, and, and their, their frequency. And, the, 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 and then what you do is draw a line on the uh, horizontal axis of risk. And what you would measure is sort of the elasticity of different kinds of crime to risk. And at the top is what we call crime of opportunity you do it because you can get away with it. And there's no risk at all, and so you do it because you can. Then there's crime of desperation. Uh, maybe I'm poor and I feel like I gotta break that window and steal that bread because I'm really quite desperate. Then there's crime of necessity. You feel like in order to hold power or in order to survive, you must commit this crime. And sometimes when the state commits crime, like torture, they feel like they have to do this. Right, it's necessity. And then if you go way down towards the bottom, you have social pathology and deviancy. A person actually can't even stop themselves from committing that crime because there's a sickness involved. All of those have different elasticity to risk. So the pathology, man, somebody who's really uh, uh, social deviant, and you see this with pedophilia and other, uh, there, you can actually ratchet up the risk level and it drops maybe a little bit, but that line actually stays pretty steady because, and that they end up going to jail in many respects too if there's decent law enforcement. Uh, then you have crime of, of necessity, and likewise, it takes a little dip, uh, but it, then it stays pretty steady too. Uh, necess, um, uh, desperation, yeah, it takes a fall a little bit, but when, they, when necessity, I mean, when desperation feels like necessity, it also flattens out. But crime of opportunity, amazing. That stuff goes out a little bit by risk and then it drops off to the zero because it was crime because I could get away with it. Now I can't get away with it. I'm just not doing it anymore. The vast, vast, vast majority of violence against the poor is crime of opportunity. And so we can, with law enforcement, reduce that amount. And then we'll be wrestling with the kind of crime that we're dealing with in our more developed uh, uh, countries, which is the hard problems of, of social deviancy and people who are desperate and have no hope, uh, all kinds of things involved here. Um, substance abuse and a whole set of factors. But all this crime of opportunity, this is where all the crime is happening against the poor because they can, and that is a very, very doable proposition. Long lecture on the elasticity of crime and then uh, <laughs> you weren't expecting in the day, maybe, but I apologize in advance. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Yes. Yeah. What Please. about the real structural situation of just the police and underpay and yeah. the fact that, it, you know, in many countries being a cop is a license to steal. Absolutely. Yeah. So that has to be addressed. That's the bad news. The good news is it's totally addressable. Uh, in other words, it, it, it's, it's not rocket science in a way. Uh, I worked uh, the first half of my career and Victor currently is at the U.S. Department of Justice dealing with police corruption. So in every society you're going to have police corruption, but it actually turns out there's things that you can do about this. Um, and one of the case studies that we look at in the book is the study of the, the country of Georgia, uh, which is a former Soviet republic, uh, and in, it was one of the most corrupt countries in the world. In fact, in 2003, Transparency International ranked it as like 143 out of 190 countries in being most corrupt. I mean, more corrupt than any country that we currently work in, and we work in some very corrupt countries. And, and yet there was a, a political election, a, a party that was committed to a platform really of, of, of anti-corruption came into power, and they seriously went after police corruption first. Just to give you an idea, police corruption in Georgia 
you would pay $10,000 to the police commissioner in order to get hired as a police officer for which you are paid $10. Why would you pay $10,000 for a job that was only going to pay you $10 a month? It's because you were given a license really to use that authority then to steal from people. Um, and what happened as a result is the state just started producing more and more police officers, right? Because I get this now. The more police officers are, the more money I make as the commissioner of police. Uh, what's, uh, and as far as payment of, of, of uh, well, I'll, I'll, let me just address that. So what they did is they came in and very committed uh, to addressing this. The first thing they did is they fired 16,000 police officers in a single day in the Capitol, sent them all home. And the place was safer and better for it. <laughs> right? Just sent them all home and rebuilt the police from the ground up. One of the things that they had to do was then pay the police very well because they wanted to recruit good people and equip them well and supply them well. Um, and as a result of a lot of this committed effort, by 2010, seven years later, the Georgian police force was rated as less corrupt than the US police, the German police, or the French police. The World Bank wrote up a study of this and it's featured in the book. So the idea, because I actually sat next, fortuitously sat next to the Prime Minister of Georgia, because I was amazed at this story and I got a chance to talk to him over dinner about it. And he said, people say that corruption is culture. He says, corruption is a choice. And when a society makes the choice to begin to root this out, it's possible. And the place to start, amazingly, is the police. Because it sounds counterintuitive in a way, because that's like the worst, scariest place. But if you think about it, corruption is a crime. It's stealing from other people. And if you have crime of corruption in the crime fighting force, your capacity to root it out from other places is just about zero. So we've kind of laughed about and joked about, oh, the police are corrupt in the developing world. No, 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 that's a serious problem because that has undermined your capacity to deal with any corruption in your country. And so that's the bad news. The good news is because this is a command structure, leadership can actually change that quite quickly if there's commitment from the top. Any other questions? Yes. You make a sensible point, right? We buy the story and everything. Why don't people act on like the Bill Gates Foundation? They have the money and everything. Why nothing is happening? Yeah. Great question, which is why isn't everybody already uh, addressing this already? That's our question, too. And actually, I, I've spent the last 10 years going around to almost every smart person I can because as this started to come to our eyes from just the daily work in the developing world, it's like, hey, isn't this a big problem? And isn't this just going to get worse? And don't we need to get out in front of it? There are some reasons why it's been very difficult. One of the, uh, the reasons is that the people who are immersed in the d academic and sort of technical uh, disciplines of fighting poverty are just very foreign to the worlds of law enforcement, right? So it's the economists, the agronomists, the clean water uh, engineers, the, um, the public health folks. What it takes to actually um, uh, do uh, highly effective law enforcement is a completely different discipline. So these worlds have been very far apart and we're trying to bring them together. The second thing is that it's been dangerous and scary for aid organizations to engage supporting law enforcement in the developing world because law enforcement is not a benign system, right? If it turned, because it's a coercive system, it's the coercive arm of the state. And if it turns bad, it commits abuses. Now you helped empower it, and you're like, oh, now we're in trouble for that. So we've actually made it illegal after human rights abuses in the 70s and 80s for aid organizations to assist police. Now that seemed like a good idea to like stop the abuses, but the answer to bad law enforcement is not going to be no law enforcement. So we need to say, yeah, there's a bad way to assist uh, uh, law enforcement, but there also clearly now are some good ways to do it, and that's what we need to pursue. Thanks again for your patience and interest, and uh, please buy the book and um, share the video and uh, help us change the discussion on the Millennium Development Goals. Thanks very much. <laughs>